Hey everybody, welcome to part two uh, on our memory unit. This time we are talking about sensory and short term. All right, let's start off with sensory memory. So we have a nearly unlimited amount of information coming at us all the time, right? We have tons of information coming into our sensory memory. All of the sounds, sights, smells, sensations, uh, all of the stimuli in our environment are coming in and sort of being briefly processed in our sensory memory. So this stores information basically just long enough for us to pay attention to it. And we're rarely conscious of our sensory information. So our attention is on a really, really important component of what makes it from sensory memory into our working or short-term memory or our sort of conscious awareness, right? So going back to sort of our discussion of attention from earlier, what do you pay attention to really matters here, right? So if we can do the stuff like, you know, maybe you're wearing socks and you aren't really aware of the feeling of you wearing socks. But when you think about it, that goes from your sensory memory into sort of your, your working memory. Or maybe there's a high-pitched whine in your environment that you're not paying attention to. Or any number of things. Um, any, any bit of sensory information, um, you can sort of work, shift your attention and make that a part of your conscious awareness. But at any given moment, there's way too much sensory stuff going on for us to really pay attention to it. There are also separate buffers of memories for each type of input. So we have a little separate bin of storage for things like sound, which we call a coax storage, or sight, which we would call iconic storage. Okay, so I think one of the best ways to really demonstrate what's happening with sensory memory and how, how briefly it, it lasts is to do a little demonstration. So we're gonna do an iconic memory demonstration. What I want you to do is focus on a plus sign that's going to appear on the screen here in just a moment. Look at that and then wait for a stimulus. You're gonna see a block of letters. After that, I want you to write down all of the items that you see. So you're gonna see it for just a brief moment in time, so get ready to write right now. Either open up a little document on your computer or um, get a little sheet of paper or whatever you wanna do. Um, so we're gonna do this demonstration here in just a second. Okay, go ahead and look at this fixation marker. And after the letters have flashed, take a moment and write everything down. Okay, that should have been enough time for you to write down everything that you were able to remember. Um, here's the stimuli that you saw. How many did you get correct? How many were you able to remember? So what you've just done is the Sperling task, which is a demonstration of iconic memory. Um, asking you to sort of report as many items as possible. Most people get about four or five to 12 with a 50 millisecond uh, presentation time like you had just there. And people often have the impression that items are fading as they're trying to say them. Right? This is something that is demonstrating how brief and transient your sensory memory is. Right? Um, this isn't something that you're able to focus your attention on really ahead of time all that well. And um, it fades very, very fast. All right, now we're going to do a different version of this. Uh, it's called partial report. What I want you to do is very, very similar. I'm going to show you a fixation marker and a block of text. What I want you to do this time is to name only items from a queued row. So after you see the block of letters, you're going to see a queue that's going to tell you which letters you need to report. Okay, same thing. So go ahead and get ready. Okay. So that should have been enough time for you to write down all the letters that you saw from the queued row. Let's see how we did. How many did you write this time? more or less than last time. So in this instance, most people get maybe about three items correct from one row compared to about four items from the total of three rows. What this shows us is that sensory storage's capacity may be unlimited, but duration is a limiting factor, right? Because our sensory storage is so transient and brief, um, you only maintain the information for about a second. It's really just sort of a race to how many things you can recall before it's gone. Um, so our, our capacity may be unlimited, um, but our ability to work with that information is very, very brief. Okay, let's talk now about short-term memory. Short-term memory provides temporary storage for information that is transferred from sensory and long-term memory. So you can go in either direction, information brought up from long-term memory or information coming from our sensory memory. This is fleeting and reflects our conscious awareness. So it's, it's just around for a brief period of time, hence short-term memory. And reflects what we're consciously aware of. Okay, to demonstrate this, uh, we're going to do what's called a digit span task. What I want you to do is pay attention to the series of numbers I'm going to present in just a moment. Uh, when you see the word now, 
uh, write down as many as you can in the order that you saw them. So try to remember the sequence of numbers and the order that they are presented and report those when you're prompted to do so. All right, we'll start here in just a sec. Okay, here we go. Okay, go ahead and write down the numbers. Okay, here's the number sequence. How many did you get correct? So we have nine numbers here. Um, most of you probably remembered somewhere between five and all nine of them. That's the sort of magic number that was established by Miller in the 50s that most people's short-term memory holds about seven plus or minus two items at a given time. So this is what we say, but is it necessarily completely accurate? So now I'm going to show you a bunch of uh, letters and it'll be on the screen for about five seconds. I want you to see how many of these you can remember this time around. Okay, here we go. Okay, go ahead and write down as many letters as you can remember. I'll give you a, a few moments here to do that. Okay, let's see how well we did this time. How many of them did you remember? Some of you may have remembered more than others. Um, some of you may have noticed that these uh, letters are actually part of commonly used acronyms. CBS, FBI, NBA, BLT, IRS. These are all meaningful pieces of information. So if you noticed that, you might have had a much easier time remembering. And that's a process we call chunking. We can remember seven plus or minus two chunks of information. Not necessarily items like letters or numbers, but meaningful pieces of information. So chunks are meaningful units of grouped items. This is one of the reasons why phone numbers are presented in small chunks. It's easier to remember. However, what we're able to chunk together relies on prior knowledge. For example, if you didn't know what the FBI was, the three-letter sequence FBI is not meaningful to you and therefore is not an easily remembered chunk of information. So expertise on a subject can help us remember more about that subject, as we'll see here in a second with experts versus novices in uh, chess playing. So in this now famous experiment, uh, participants were presented with um, a spatial piece of information, right? A chess board uh, with pieces of chess, uh, or chess pieces rather, placed along, those bo along the board and were asked to recall how many, however many pieces they could after a time limit had passed. So there were some key differences in the stimuli that were presented. This is a random board position, so it's a position of chess pieces that is randomly determined. And this is a sort of actual chess board position in which it's a plausible um, configuration of chess pieces for a particular chess strategy. So here's what we see. Um, and then uh, novices, so people who are, have no experience really with chess, we see no difference between their memory for a real game and a fake game in terms of recalling the number of, of pieces. But what we see with the experts is they show a much stronger memory for real chessboard configurations over fake chessboard configurations because the configuration of those chess pieces together was meaningful, right? They were able to chunk chess pieces together about because of the relationships between those chess pieces and what that might mean and recall better from their short-term memory, right? In the same way that you or I can take, you know, acronyms of, of common organizations and remember them as meaningful pieces of information, people with enough expertise in chess could take configurations of chess pieces and chunk them together in terms of their meaning. A novice can't do that because the chess piece relationships have no meaning to them. So short-term memory is what it says. It's short-term. So how long does it last? The Brown-Peterson task, um, participants were uh, put in one of two conditions where they either hear letters and then are immediately asked to recall those letters, or hear the letters, have to sit around for a recall interval where they're not really doing much, and then are asked to recall the letters after. Um, you can see in the first group that these people perform well, but after a recall interval, a period of time passing between hearing the letters and recalling them, they perform poorly. Our short-term memory fades with time, but how quickly does it fade? So we can see here 
that the proportion correct, so basically the, the amount of letters they're able to call, recall correctly, decreases rapidly with the passage of time uh, on the order of seconds, right? So uh, these participants got everything correct after a no delay condition, but after three seconds, they lose a lot of information. And by the time we're out to 15 seconds or so, they're about as bad as they're gonna get and have forgotten most of the word list, maybe remembering one or two items. So what this shows us is in a passive situation where you're just given a list of items and then asked to sit there and not really think about anything, those things fade pretty rapidly, right? It, it's really hard to, to recall information after even only a few seconds. So what can we do about that? So we can improve the duration that items remain in our short-term memory via rehearsal. Rehearsal is what we can do to actively keep information in mind to in increase the duration of information's time in our short-term memory. So there's two real ways of doing this. There's maintenance rehearsal, which is just repeating information in your head. So if, for example, your friend gives you an address and you're trying to plug that into your phone, um, you might have to repeat that in your head until you're able to draw your phone out and open up the right app. Um, you have to keep that in mind. So to do that, you might just repeat the address in your head over and over again. There's also elaborative rehearsal. So thinking about the relationship between two items to sort of enhance your, your memory for that. So if, for example, the address your friend gives you is 1812 Washington Drive, you might say to yourself, oh, uh, well, I know some, some information about that. Washington didn't, Washington didn't fight in the War of 1812. So if you remember that phrase, elaborate on it, uh, thinking about the relationship between the two items, it makes it easier for you to remember and to keep working with. So maintenance rehearsal is good for the short term. It's not great for remembering things after the time has passed. So uh, just sort of wrote, remembering that information, repeating it in your head over and over again. It's going to keep it active in your short term memory, but doesn't really help you recall things that well later on. Whereas elaborative rehearsal is good for helping you to recall things after longer breaks. This is because of the multiple connections, right? Connecting Washington didn't fight in the War of 1812. That's a rich sort of memory to encode. You might be able to picture it. Uh, or have some sort of um, a rich way of encoding that. The more connections you make with what you're trying to remember and things that you already know, the easier it is to remember them later. It gives you more cues to use to recall that information. Okay, uh, that's all we're going to say about short-term memory. Next time, we're on to the very closely related phenomenon of working memory.